Hi guys, and welcome back to another TechMinds video. So if you're a lucky owner of a HackRF or HackRF with the Porter Pack, then you may or may not know about a common issue that can affect the receive of these devices. Now for years now, I've owned several HackRFs and Porter Pack combos and never actually come across this issue until now. Now this Porter Pack on screen now is actually a few years old. And when I pulled it out to perform some tests for something else, I was presented with the dreaded receive issue. Now I have a few solutions for you if you have come across this yourself on your HackRF or HackRF with Porter Pack combo. But first, let's talk about where this issue affects. Whether you're using an SDR application or the Porter Pack, you will have control over three different areas that control the receive path on the HackRF. Now this is a screenshot from the Porter Pack where we can increase or decrease the setting value for the LNA or VGA. The LNA or low noise amplifier has a setting range of between zero to 40 with 16 being the recommended starting point. Now this LNA actually applies gain to the IF stage of the receiver. We then have the VGA, which is a variable gain amplifier. Now this has a setting range of between zero to 62, so it has a little more finer control compared to the LNA. The VGA actually applies gain to the baseband, so this is a setting you need to use with care as to not overload the receiver. The final setting that is located in the receive path is an amp. Now this can either be turned on or off. Now there's no in between, it will amplify the signal either by 14 dB or 0 dB, with 0 dB essentially being turned off. On the Porter Pack, the amp status is shown as 0 for 0 dB and 1 for 14 dB amplification. Now this is where the common receive problem lies, with the amp feature. More specifically, it is the actual receive chip on the circuit board. The original design of the HackRF, and one of the reasons why so many people have complained over the years of losing the ability to receive, is down to this specific amplifier chip that is highly sensitive to overloading and static buildup. Now this can cause a permanent failure for this chip, and as shown here with the amp turned off, only the LNA and VGA are working, but when you turn the amp on, you completely lose all reception. Now this is the problem with my older HackRF, which we're going to fix. Now there's roughly three solutions to fix this issue. The first, which is kind of similar to the third, which we will elaborate more on later, will be to go out and buy another HackRF board. You can of course then use your existing portal pack with your new HackRF, assuming you had one that is. Now the second fix, which is a cheaper option, would be to repair the PCB by replacing the chip that is responsible for the AMP feature within the receive path. Now this is not a repair job for the faint hearted, the part is incredibly small and the use of a magnifier and tweezers of sorts will definitely be needed. The chip which is damaged is this one here, this little thing causing all these receive issues. Now talking of receive issues, if you do not use a porter pack with your HackRF, but you connect your HackRF directly to your computer and use an SDR application like SDR Sharp, you can see if the issue is there when you tick the little tick box titled AMP. As I enable the AMP option here on the left, all signals disappear from the waterfall. So that's another way in which you can test your HackRF to see if it has this fault. Now with my trusty microscope, some tweezers and a soldering iron, I'll now attempt to replace this part. You can get this part quite cheap from AliExpress and well, I'll leave a link in the video description if you wanna check it out. However, I actually got this replacement part from Amazon here in the UK and well, it was actually five times the price compared to AliExpress, but I'm impatient and did not want to wait for the slow boat from China. I didn't record all of this process, but essentially we first had to remove the faulty part located here. These tweezer soldering iron is super handy for removing these components quickly. 
Now, once removed, I just cleaned the board a little with some isopropyl alcohol and then soldered the new chip in place, making sure to get it the correct way around. I did apply a little bit more solder, but I didn't have the final clip of how I'd done this, but this is how it kind of looked. So with the HackRF all back together in the porter pack after replacing this chip, let's see if it now works. Well, there we go, working once again. Simply seen by enabling the AMP feature and seeing the signal levels increase and not completely obliterated. But the same goes for software. And in this example, I'm tuned to a 23 centimeter Morse code beacon at around 1.296 gigahertz. With the amp turned off, we can hear the beacon very, very faintly. But as soon as the amp feature is turned on, not only can we see a stronger signal, the SNR and loudness of that beacon increases. So yep, that's a job well done and worth the effort of replacing the chip. Now I also saved myself some money here by repairing it myself. This example actually goes to show why we really need this AMP feature working. Now I know not all of you will be able to perform such jobs with such small components. And while fix three is essentially the same as my suggestion of fix one, this time we can purchase another hack RF which already has been upgraded with improved performance and rejection of static and overloading on that receive input. Yep, I'm talking about the Clifford Heath design and all the details for this are available on the GitHub page. As the HackRF project is open source, you'll find many HackRF board revisions around on the internet. Ensuring you purchase a Clifford Heath version can be done by visiting the open source SDR Lab website and ordering a Clifford Heath HackRF version from there. So here's a list of all the changes and improvements that have been made to this Clifford Heath version of the HackRF. And most of these changes have been geared towards the protection of the board, specifically around the receive path from overloading and static. There has also been some improvements made to the USB port, eliminating more noise that comes from it. And this has been performed by adding common mode transformers. Pretty neat idea there. Now you can pause the video and read through all of these if you want to, or visit the website linked below. If you are in the market for a new Hack RF, then this is the board to purchase, especially if you want more reliability and for it to last longer. Of course, all electronics can be subject to static or electrical noise. So don't expect it to magically perform a whole lot better, but what you will have is a far more protection against your hack RFs receive being damaged accidentally, like we've seen on previous models. The version I received came in a metal case, and weirdly enough, it didn't have any SMA sockets soldered for the clock in and clock out ports, but there's actually some mention of that on the website, and you can order them separately if you need them. A great addition, in my opinion, with the Clifford Heath version of the Hack RF is that you now get a USB-C port rather than those flimsy and unreliable USB micro sockets. Now, they never seem to last for me, especially if you unplug and plug in quite often. USB-C, in my opinion, is way better for these kind of devices. Let me know your thoughts down below. So there we go, guys. If you're in the market for a new Hack RF board, and check out the Clifford Heath version. If you're also experiencing issues with a receive problem on an old Hack RF board, maybe give it a go trying to repair yourself. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. Thanks to my subscribers, my YouTube members, and my patrons. And you guys take care of yourselves, and I'll see you in the next video.